Have you heard that God offered deliverance? In this lesson, we will learn that God will indeed restore us and make all things new in our lives. Happy Sunday. Are you missing your Sunday school? Would you like to be a part of our Sunday school? Then like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, and you'll be notified every time I post a new video to our Sunday school. Congratulations to the two winners of our Sunday School Bible, uh, Shalom813 and Dorothy Watt. Please email me at the email address I'm going to have on the screen here so that I can send you your study Bible. And thank everybody who participated. This was wonderful. I think we're going to do one more. Hi, I'm Regina Reed, and I teach Sunday School at Antioch Missionary Baptist Church in Maven, Mississippi. Now let's get into this lesson. Today's lesson is God offers deliverance. It's coming from Isaiah, the 51st chapter, verses 1 through 8. And our lesson aims is one, examine Isaiah's example of God's rich faithfulness in Israel's spiritual history. Two, feel encouraged through personal trust in God, even when others speak negatively about our faith. And three, Share the goodness and deliverance of God with others. Background scriptures. It's coming from Isaiah, the 51st chapter, verses 1 through 8. And our key verse is Isaiah 54, verse 1. Let's start with a prayer. Thank you, Lord, for these reminders that you have always loved and admonished your people. As we leave class, now, we ask for wisdom in making the tough decisions that are ahead of us this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our introduction. We've heard this since we were small children. Look both ways before crossing the street and then cross when it's safe. That's still good advice, but it's not adequate for the present culture. Why? One reason is that there are so many more ways to be distracted than in the past. The distractions take place for those who walk, for drivers of automobiles, and those who ride bicycles. At intersections, it sometimes appears as if nobody looks. The pedestrians seem oblivious to traffic lights, stop signs, and walkways. They are focused on things such as making calls, reading text messages, or ebooks, or listening to podcasts or music. Those on wheels are also seen looking at devices instead of at the road. The look both ways in admiration is no longer enough. People also need to stay aware of their surroundings. The result is that the old saying could be changed to look up, then look both ways before crossing the street. This lesson will develop three looks that were given to the people of Judah to look to the past, the future, and straight into the present. Lesson context. The opening lines of Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities are easily re recognized by many readers. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. The same words could be used to describe Judas during Isaiah's ministry. The best of times were reflected in Judah's economic and military proudness. The worst of times were marked by the sin of idolatry and consequent exile of Babylon. In many ways, Judah's punishment was an indictment of the false gods of the sins. Those gods condoned the people had turned from the true God in spite of the great acts of deliverance they had experienced as a nation and the admonitions of the Ten Commandments to have no other God of graven images. And the exiles did have a purifying effect. Following the Babylon captivity, Jewish idolatry was never a serious problem again. Though the course of the issue arose, the Jews were returned, who returned stood firm on their faithful foundation, no matter what foreign invaders tried to tempt them with new gods. Though they had suffered through the worst of times, even better, their previous best times were still ahead. We can also assert that Babylon was punished for following their false gods. Had their worship been rendered to God and concerned with justice and righteousness instead of acquisition and power, the story of Babylon's empire would have been very different. 
In Isaiah 46 through 47, God mocked the Babylonian idolatry and its associated practices. The idols have to be carried, but God's judgment would have them carried away. Though the people bow to the gods they made, the God of the heavens had declared their end. Their best times were about to come to an abrupt close. Lesson scripture, Isaiah 51, 1 through 8. Verse 1. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence ye were hewn, and to the hole of the pit which ye were digged. The summons to Israel is addressed to the pursuers of righteousness and the seekers of Yahweh. That is, the ones deeply serious about faith, anyone who has walked in a rock quarry gains a sense of past history from the layers of a rock wall. The poet used this imagery in Israel 5 and 1, 51 and 1 to suggest the people can draw strength by recalling the courage of the courage of Abraham and Sarah in the very rock quarry from which they were excavated. Verse 2. Look unto Abraham your father and unto Sarah that bear you for I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. Trusting in the Lord Sarah and Abraham left their home country and family and journeyed to a new land where their descendants were to become a people and a blessing to all of the families of the earth. A similar challenge was now being given to those in captivity in Babylon. The exiles were instructed to recall the ancestors and cherish the memory of the fact that God bestows miraculous blessings upon the people in the most unlikely circumstances. Verse 3, for the Lord comforted Zion, he will conduct all her waste places and he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. These verses begin by saying, for the Lord shall comfort Zion. Those places drained of life resources were now to be comforted and blessed like the very Garden of Eden, they were to exude the wondrous power of life, even in the midst of hardship and tribulation. God's people are called upon to put their trust in the God who promises to come among them in the future and make all things new. What God needs most is not human ability, but rather human availability. Verse 4. Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation. For a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest in a light of the people. Israel had reason to continue to trust in God, even though the bleakness of their Babylonian captivity, because God's justice and promises are everlasting. The establishment of the justice of God throughout the earth would function as a light to the nation. These nations would no longer walk in the darkness of their own understanding. At some point, these nations turned to God and were saved. They bowed their knees to and swore allegiance only to God. Verse 5. My righteousness is near. My salvation is gone forth and my arm shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me, and on my arm shall they trust. The impact of God's justice is evident. Because his arm justly rules the nations, the second half of this verse describes the impact God's salvation will have on the foreign nations that come to trust in him. The just rule of God will have a significant spiritual influence on people from many big nations, as well as the far-flung, somewhat insignificant, small island nations. The Lord's purpose moved beyond Israel and now embraced people and coastlands, representing the whole earth. Verse 6, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But... My salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Three illustrations of God's purposeful acts 
our attention that is smoke, garment, and mats. These illustrations got outlined the temporary nature of the material creation in order to advance God's everlasting purpose. That air and sky will vanish like smoke indicates their fleeting character compared to the Lord's endurance. Death remains the fate of every living creature, but the Lord's salvation and righteousness will remain when all else fails. In spite of human circumstances, the prophet encourages the people to place their trust in the everlasting God. Verse 7, Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revelings. The Lord is talking to Israel in exile with a third summons to listen. The summons is similar to the first one in verse 1. Now the Lord's teaching in their hearts meant that they could withstand the taunts and insults of their enemies, whether fellow enemies or Babylonians. Through it all, they were to remain steadfast, confident that God would deliver them in his own time. The call for confident courage in the face of haters is a common theme in the biblical story. The basis for courage lies in a firmly rooted spiritually and not simply a firmly self-will. Like ancient Israel, God's people today are never to fear the scorn of others. The ungodly will perish, but God's deliverance will endure forever. Verse 8. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But, our, but my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. The strength of God's word is the main reason why the righteous should not fear. Remaining faithful to their God, our God, would not be a source of embarrassment, but rather support when the unrighteous accusers and naysayers fall apart. God is on the side of the righteous and the obedient, and his deliverance is both certain and sure. No one should be discouraged, but remain steadfast in obedience to God. Conclusion Looking to our past offers important insight about faithfulness, examples to follow and not follow. The people and events that have shaped us, Isaiah prepared the nation to look forward to Jesus. But we look to the past, present, and future when we look to him. The salvation work Jesus has done is the reason for our joy in the present and our hope in the future. So when we think about whether to look at the past, present, or future, the answer is all three. Look to Christ in his ministry, his sacrifice, his death, and resurrection. Look to the body of Christ that continues to call the world to repent of sins and be reconciled to him. And look to the glorious future when God's promises of eternal life will no longer be a hope, but a present eternal reality. And I thought to remember, hear that? God is calling. If you have enjoyed this lesson, leave a comment, give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and let's love each other. Let's pray for each other. Let's protect each other. And I will see you all next week.